All right. Well, thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, on this particular bit, I'm going to be introducing uh, myself very quickly and then our panelists. So uh, I probably should have done this at the beginning of the day, but I'm uh, Maggie McAlpine. I've been working in election security now for our, about nine years as an auditing specialist. I've worked on a few things like the um, Estonia e-voting report with the University of Michigan. I worked with, um, I was an advisor for the Secretary of State of California and their risk limiting audit program in 2011. And these days I work with advising states on their cybersecurity um, initiatives and uh, generally just helping them out. So uh, this panel is the um, how, how journalists can, uh, I, I should know this because it's my panel, uh, but uh, uh, how journalists basically can help with cybersecurity and we are joined by three amazing panelists and I'm going to introduce them quickly and then I think we're just going to jump into discussion rather than doing like an opening remarks thing. So um, first in the middle we have Kevin Collier reporter with CNN. Uh, he covers the uh, intersection of cybersecurity and national security, including efforts to safeguard election integrity. He has previously worked with BuzzFeed News, uh, Vocative, and The Daily Dot. Um, on the end, we have uh, Kim Zetter. We're very honored to have her. She's been just institutional knowledge, you wouldn't believe. Uh, she's a longtime cybersecurity uh, and national security reporter for various publications, including Wired, Politico, and the New York Times Magazine, and is the author of the book Countdown to Zero Day, Stuxnet, and the launch of the world's first digital weapon. She has broken numerous national stories over the years about NSA surveillance, digital warfare, WikiLeaks, and the hacker underground, and has been one of the nation's leading journalists covering voting machine and election security since 2003. And closest to me is Eric Geller, uh, the cybersecurity reporter for Politico. Uh, Eric Geller is a journalist on Politico's cybersecurity team. His primary beats consist of cyber policy making at the White House, the Justice Department, the State, State Department, the Commerce Department, but also he regularly covers election security, data breaches, malware outbreaks, and other cyber issues affecting the government, uh, private sector, and society at large. And wanted me to mention, Politico now has an election security tracker that is just implemented. Um, so just to dive right in, um, I think the first question we were going to ask, um, well, actually, um, yeah, let me, let me pass this over. So it's just, wait, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I got to ask the question first. So, um, I'm, we're, I'm used to having more microphones when I do panels, but, uh, so, um, one of the first questions I thought just to kind of jump right in, uh, and that I thought might be relevant to this crowd is, um, what, what should hackers do if they discover vulnerability in the election world? Um, how can they reach out to journalists and what can they expect in the process? I can do it, I feel like this is Kim's. Uh, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, well, I mean, so uh, a lot of work has been done on voting machines already and Maggie participated in some of the most famous reports um, back in 2007. And um, you should look at those online and see um, what already has been discovered. So if you're doing work, you don't want to repeat some of the work that's already been done, um, but there's still a lot of work to do and there are new voting machines coming out. Um, there are a lot of election security experts who've been doing this for a decade, um, including Maggie and her husband. Uh, her, sorry, is he husband? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, Harry Hursty. Um, the people running the conference, Matt Blaze. Um, I would suggest if you find something, reach out to those people. Get context for what you found or what you think you found. They can help you understand it. And the benefit of that, the, the bonus of that is these people also have um, expertise in how elections are run, the process. And so if you find something, they can tell you, well, there are mitigations for this. Or um, the, they'll tell you the process that um, is used in elections to actually check this. Um, and that helps you when and if you decide to go to a voting machine company and disclose this. There's, uh, you know, they have just recently launched uh, bug bounty programs. That's just going to be interesting to watch to see how these actually work, if they work the way we expect them to work um, in the rest of the industry. Um, and um, you're going to want to be armed with information because if they try and tell you that something is not a bug, you're actually going to want to know. If they tell you, well, election process will catch this, it would be good for you to have that knowledge, if nothing more than have Matt Blaze or someone else give you that knowledge, um, so you know what it is that you have and what um, can be mitigated and what can't be mitigated. Um, and then come to a journalist, or even come to the journalist first, and I can help broker that um, with you, with Matt or someone else. Um, but I'm always interested in hearing about election security issues, vulnerabilities, anything like that. But it, it, it does help if you, and save time for everyone, if you have a good idea already, um, if something has already been covered or something's already been found. There's not much I can add to that, um, except I, th I would strongly recommend going to a journalist who you do trust, who, you know, 
any of us works or, or you know, someone who covers this rather than institution itself. Um, and then also, as a source, remember, you do have a bit of power. You can say, look, I want to bring this to you, but can we talk off the record? You know, don't, don't quote me right now. Let me talk through this idea. Let's have a conversation that I'm not, I don't have to fear that I'm going to, you know, be taken out of context or something. Um, you're, you're allowed to set those terms with the reporter, um, and it's probably smart to do so. I would just also add that most of us are not technical people. So understand that you're going to have to do a lot more explaining than you're going to have to do if you're talking to Matt Blaze, if you're talking to one of your fellow researchers. Um, we like to think that we, you know, osmotically pick up some of this technical knowledge along the way, but for the most part, we need things explained to us, and that also helps us explain it to our readers who, as you can imagine, 99% of them are going to need everything explained to them. Um, even, you know, I write mostly for sort of a, a government, you know, Capitol Hill industry audience, but even those people are very typically high and mid-level, not the people at the ground level working on the technical details. They're the decision makers, and they need things explained to them too, just like the general public. So talk to us as if we are, you know, what we are, which is a conduit to the people who need to see your work. So... Well, I, I got to thank you for that because you lead me perfectly into my next question, which was um, how to convey um, technical topics to non-technical audiences um, and do them justice. I mean, I think you have to start at, you know, you have to abstract out from the vulnerability that is presented to you. The, the researcher comes to you and says, I found a way to do this and it's not supposed to be done. It's not supposed to work this way. As a journalist, you have to go to them and then say, why does that matter? What's the end result of this? What does this look like, in this case, for the voter in the polling booth or for the election worker sitting in front of the EMS? What does this look like for the end user of this product? Because ultimately, people who are reading my stories about vulnerabilities don't really care that you know this is a problem with the system and everybody said it was secure, uh, but it's not secure and you're not supposed to be able to do this, but you can. What they care about is what does that mean in the real world? Um, people in this room are probably very interested in the vulnerability for the vulnerability's sake in addition to the outcome. My readers only care about the outcome. And so it's helpful for me to be able to say, you know, so-and-so found a thing that could let people do X, Y, and Z. That's typically how we describe it is what is the outcome of this vulnerability and you know as somebody who knows more than most of my readers and constantly has to scale back what I'm presenting so that they're not overwhelmed I would imagine that for researchers out there you also have to kind of scale back what you're telling the journalist because we probably don't need to know 50% of the sort of things that you find interesting about this bug or about this problem what we need to know is the things that we can explain to people so they get the implications. And so, you know, do a little bit of that scaling back. Make sure that you're explaining it to us in a way where even a really stupid person, and none of us here are stupid people, but it needs to be something that a stupid person could understand, um, or someone, let's say, with, with average intelligence about cybersecurity, right? Those are the people ultimately making decisions that your research can affect. So make sure they can understand it. So the difference is context, right? So a security researcher, oh, sorry, I forgot that you're not mic'd. Uh, so the gentleman asks, how is it different from the researcher writing the article instead of the journalist? Which is a fair question. And the difference is that the journalist brings in the context of how does this vulnerability fit into the political or administrative ecosystem that we're talking about. So the journalist is out there talking to the election officials, whether about this specific issue or about other issues. The journalist is talking to people at DHS and the FBI to understand how this fits into law enforcement and defensive activities, critical infrastructure protection. The, the reader does not just need to know, you know, here is the thing that might appear on, you know, the, the, the CVE, you know, page in, in, the, in the system that tracks vulnerabilities. They, they can go there if they're smart enough to want to see all those details. Most readers want to understand why this matters to them and how this fits into the things that they're doing on a daily basis. And journalists are sort of the translator of that for a real world audience, for people who are not, frankly, in the DEF CON bubble. If I can add, um if you have a vulnerability or you have an issue you want to bring up the oh, sorry. Uh, if I want to add that if you have a vulnerability, you have an issue like this that you do bring a, a, to a reporter and you want to say write your own technical paper aside that, I mean, you absolutely should. I don't know, am I allowed we'll to Yeah. Am I allowed to call him? Yeah. <laughs> And 
understand that it doesn't matter what the number of the color is, the bills are being pushed out, the DAC is a joke, and even what some of the states are trying to do is like a budget, how can you as a reporter convey that better than somebody of my own? I mean, I think, sorry. Um, it's it's how do we as reporters uh, convey concerns um, better than someone who, say, for example, has a law degree and is an ethical hacker? Um, I think I don't know. I kind of want to echo Eric here. It, it's context. It doesn't mean that we do have better perspective necessarily. It's that we have a you know we work in an institution that that has a mass audience um, that we work as translators basically from you guys. To the public, that doesn't um, mean you're. You know, that, I don't think that has to stand in opposition to your role. But yeah. I mean, it sounds like a question just in partisanship and how to mitigate that. No? All right. Um, how about we hold, can we table that? Can you think of a way to shorten that one and we'll table it for the actual Q&A part and we'll do that in about 10 minutes. So, so let's just go on to the next question here. Thank you. Um, so, um, so actually, uh, but that, that I can maybe use it a little bit as a jumping off. So, um, so elections are an interesting and somewhat unique problem in that even just sort of, and this was the argument for a long time, even discussing the possibility that an election could be hacked was not discussed for a while, or at least was uh, criticized when it was, because um, simply casting the doubt on an election is a form of attack in and of itself. So like, how do you balance reporting on vulnerabilities, not blowing them out of proportion, keeping things, uh, but also um, that, that, that level of responsibility around alarmism too, would you say? So I, I write for both mainstream media and I write for tech publications like Motherboard. And so um, the, I mean, when it merits it, I will take the story to Motherboard for a lot of technical details. And I know who my audience is, right? I know the audience wants those details and they understand them and it's not going to take, get taken out of proportion. But then it gets picked up by other media and um, they will take the, the top level of it um, and kind of run with it. So there's, there's only so much that you can control. You try and uh, have as balanced of a story as you can um, to get that first story out and so that's established. Um, and then if it gets picked up and sensationalized or errors get put in or whatever, you still have that initial um, uh, factual story there and people can come back to it. Um, people complain a lot about headlines. And, you know, the story can be very balanced and not sensational, and then a sensational headline gets put on it. And reporters don't like that because it undermines all the hard work that you've done. And all people do is focus on the headline. Um, so, you know, I'm just putting out that as sort of context for you, that even if a story seems sensational from the headline, um, take some time to actually dig into it because it may not actually be that sensational. Um, and we do try and push back on uh, headlines that we don't think um, properly represent the, either the content or the story or, or the level um, of um, what that vulnerable, vulnerability represents, um, but we're not always successful because um, you know, publications uh, don't want to put time into a story if you're not going to read it. And sometimes you have to create a headline that is actually going to make people read it while still being a truthful headline and not sensational. Um, but, so. so my anecdote about this is um, when I was here last year, I was uh, writing for, for BuzzFeed. 
angle on it, and I, I said, you know, I want to do how you know people like Matt and Hari are uh, who've worked for on this issue for 15 years or God knows how long. Uh, and now all of a sudden they have a microphone in a way they had not in previous years. And how does that change how you, uh, you know, raise the alarm about issues in election systems? And so I would like to think, I mean, you can Google it and find the story. I would like to think I presented a fairly nuanced view about that. Um, but it was a longish story. And some editor said, you know, I'd like it if we, if we have some sort of anecdotal lead. And I mentioned that, well, you know, we could throw a line in there about, about the kids that were um, you know, playing on a, you know, like a, a version of a Secretary of State uh, website. And so the headline became, a, a four, you know, a 10-year-old just hacked the Secretary of State's website, discuss, And it was by far the most widely shared story of my career. Like millions of people. And that was great. And how many just shared that headline and took away the wrong idea? How many read the story and took away what I would like to think is the right idea? I don't know. But that is, I think, it's how we share information. And God, I know it's not perfect, but I don't know of a better one. Um, so uh, jumping now on to maybe, and, and by the way, I love anecdotes. If you have any stories you also want to do it, you've also done some great journalism reporting lately. So if that finds a way into the discussion, I certainly won't mind. Um, so uh, one of the questions we had discussed was, you know, how do you... Um, there's sort of a delicate way and an indelicate way of saying it. So the delicate way is, um, how do you juggle competing claims by various uh, aspects of this, uh, election officials or security researchers? But also there's a less politic one. What do you do if somebody like, just as completely random example, I promise, a vendor were to simply lie to you about what's the truth versus what they say in their you know, PR is happening? So I'm sure Kim has stories, but I just very, very briefly wanted to say I have a great example of this, which is, um, as mentioned, we did just launch a tracker that looks at every county in the country that uses paperless voting machines, and we tell you where they are in the process of replacing them. And uh, we also looked at the states that are doing this at the state level. Almost all of those states are trying to get to some form of paper. I know that ballot marking devices are controversial, so we'll just leave that aside. But the one state that said it was not replacing the paperless voting machines that it does have is Oklahoma, uh, which has... Um, Gosh, I don't remember. It's the eScan AT. Uh, they're for voters with disabilities. Most people do vote on paper. But I contacted Oklahoma and I said, "We're going to put, it's, you know, we're putting this on the page. We're mentioning that you use these paperless machines." And the spokeswoman for the election board said, "They're not paperless. They do have paper." Uh, I went to a gentleman who used to work at Heart, who I actually seen the audience here, and I went to someone at the Great Group Verified Voting, and I said, "Is this true?" They said, "No, it's not true. These devices do not." produce individual paper vote records, went back to the secretary's, uh, the election board spokeswoman. I said, here's the information from the experts. And uh, she never responded. To this day, they have not addressed this, this point about the eScan AT. But what she did say before was, at the end of the, the voting session, each machine prints out a piece of paper that shows all the votes cast on that machine. And that was her view of a paper vote record, right? That, to her, that meant that this machine wasn't paperless. And so you do have this problem, and I saw this at counties too, where there just isn't this basic cyber literacy. And I sort of see it as analogous to climate reporting in the sense that there are people who have spent their careers doing peer-reviewed research, uh, have produced falsifiable uh, claims that could be falsified if, if they were not true, and nobody came out and, and demonstrate that they were false. And so that is sort of the emerging consensus in the expert community of what's true and what's false. And when you have somebody else who doesn't spend their life doing this, who comes in and says, the experts are wrong, it's not my place to say that person is wrong or is lying. But what I do do is I make sure that I emphasize, here are the people with the expertise, here's the consensus. We probably use the word consensus more than almost any other word as a euphemism for the people who typically know what they're talking about. Uh, and that's because, you know, for various reasons, it's not our place to say liar, idiot, you know, I hope, no, I'm not appointing at idiots here, but um, that's not our job. But we do have to just sort of convey the people who are typically uh, the experts, the people who are typically not the experts. Um, that's my contribution to that. I let my sources say that the vendors are lying. Um, so I have been lied to um, multiple times. Um, the first time that I was lied to was all the way back in 
2004, covering elections in California. The voting, this was the when we were still paperless machines and trying to get paper. California was the first. Um, and um, there were some disability groups um, lobbying for the vendors. And I asked one of the disability group guys, have any of the vendors given you any money? And he says, no, absolutely not. And then six months later, the New York Times writes that they got money from one of the voting machine vendors. So I did write that in my story, that they told me this, and then six months later, the New York Times wrote that. That's what I do. Uh, election systems and software. I wrote an a article for the New York Times about modems and remote access. There were some people in Pennsylvania who found, uh, who were asked to look at the machines by uh, a Pennsylvania Board of Elections and they discovered that the machine had PC Anywhere on it. This is the back-end election management system that programs the votes and ballots before elections, tabulates the votes afterward, and that PC Anywhere was being used uh, by, well, um, they saw a log uh, that showed that it was being used for several hours the night before the election, and that was the voting machine vendor or whoever, a contractor doing troubleshooting. Um, so I went back to election systems and software and I asked them and I, and I started looking through contracts and the contracts actually say, particularly one in Michigan, actually talks about installing PC anywhere. They say we might sometimes need to do technical support and we, d we can't send someone to the field and so we'll want to dial in. So we want you to install this PC anywhere. Okay, it's, it's written in the contract. And I call up ESNS and I uh, ask them, have you ever installed remote access software on your voting machines? And they said, no, never. We've never sold or uh, installed on your voting machines. That story came out in February 2018. Um, um, Senator Wyden sees the story and sends a letter to try and get them on the record about this. I mean, it's on the record in the story, but to try and see what they'll say to a lawmaker. Uh, the answer then is they come back and they say, well, we installed uh, remote access software on um, a few systems between the years 2000 and 2006. And that came out in, I wrote a story on that, I think in March, April, so we're now two months later. And then NPR speaks with ESNS uh, in September. And they ask the same question, have you ever installed remote access software on your, your um, systems? And they tell them what they install it in 300 districts, jurisdictions. So we've gone from no, absolutely never, what are you talking about, how can you even suggest that, to a few systems, but it didn't really matter. It was a long time ago in 2000, 2006, to 300 jurisdictions, okay? So that's what we're dealing with. And multiply that by the information that they give to vendors. If they're lying to journalists, they're lying to vendors. And that's the subject of a story that I published this week, where vendors have been telling the public for years, um, they've been telling uh, their election customers that these voting machines and those back-end election management systems are not, never have been, never will be connected to the internet. In fact, they are. And in fact, it is in the request for proposal documents that they give states. The problem is, is that states look at it and they don't know how to interpret it. They don't see there's a firewall there. There's even actually in a document that ESNS gave to Rhode Island, it actually shows the modem transmitting votes from the voting machine on election night. These are optical scan machines. It shows wireless modem, nice little cloud, and then it says internet, and then a firewall over here. So. I, I don't understand the disconnect, how um, that can be in a document, and yet they tell the public and they tell election officials they're not connected to the internet. Um, and then the story that we found today was not only are they connected to the internet, because they'll say they're only connected for a few minutes, they're only connected over cellular modems, only cellular network. Uh, the story that I wrote last year was actually cellular networks are internet. Um, the, but they'll say it's only a couple of minutes, so it doesn't matter. The story this week was, no, they've been connected for years. For months and years they've been on. Um, so it's a problem. Um, and sometimes the ESNS, after I did the, the remote access story, they put out a, uh, a press release with facts. And they said again, and it was very care carefully parsed. So what do you do in a situation like that? You don't want to say right out, you're lying, and you've lied to me, and you're lying to readers and election officials. 
So I took a screenshot of it. Um, I put in red my responses. I, I annotated it. Um, where they were saying this, I said, this is not actually true. This is, this is what the, the real situation is. They're saying this here, but they're carefully parsing their words. This is what it really means. And that's how I tried to combat it so that it stops it at, at the beginning. Um, because once they get that out and everyone just keeps repeating it in media interview after media interview, because that's what will happen. The election districts take the lead of the, the vendors and, and take their talking points, and then it just goes on. Um, so that's how I try to combat it. I can go, but I mean. So I think now I would like to open up to audience questions, but I will do so with a quick caveat. It needs to be a question, not a statement. And it needs to be, you know, under 10 seconds to deliver if possible. So I will cut you off. It's not because I don't like you. I just need to keep this moving. So um, would anybody please raise your hand? And I'm going to ask the people who answer to repeat your question. Otherwise, I, I think I can hear people. Uh, Ion? Yes, my question is, when I'm reading reports around different counties and jurisdictions purchasing equipment, the last piece of information I never find in that is, what is the manufacturer and what type of product it is? That's not in any of the journalist stories. My pet peeve. It is my pet peeve. So, There's absolutely no reason for Should I repeat? So the, the question was, basically, I'm annoyed that journalists never say the make and model of the voting machines that are purchased when they're talking about a county buying equipment. So I will say for myself, as someone who's also annoyed by that, I always try to mention it. Um, you see a lot of local news articles that's like, the local reporter is at the county, you know, I, in a lot of states called like the commissioner's court. That's basically like the local like decision-making body. And they approve the purchase of paper-based voting machines. And it never says what exactly they bought. And it is extremely annoying. And in a lot of those cases, I think it's that the local reporter maybe doesn't have the sort of the dexterity, the cybersecurity knowledge to understand that for you folks out there reading that story, it actually matters what that model is so you can determine, is this really a paper-based voting machine? Is this a voting machine that I just tested last week and then I know it has some problem? Yeah, that's a huge problem. And I think it just comes down to, you know, we, we put that in because we understand why that matters. But a lot of people writing about these decisions uh, are writing about them as part of normal everyday county business, not necessarily expecting that people like you in the audience are going to be reading these stories for sort of very technical and really national security related concerns. I mean, there's a wonderful source for this for e even you if you don't see it in a story and you know this, Ian. Um, Verified Voting has a verifier tool online. It's a l it can be a little outdated. He's got this great tool that they put together, um, published on Monday, about what states are moving towards, what systems. But the Verified Voting, historically, it's great. You can go back to, I think, 2004, 2002, if you ever want to see what voting machine was used in a jurisdiction during uh, the 2004 elections or something like this. Um, and it drills down. It's, it's, uh, you can drill down by state and then all the way down to county. And they will list the voting machine that's used in the polling place, the voting machine that's used for um, absentee ballots um, that are mail-in ballots. Um, they'll use uh, oftentimes a different system for disabled voters, and they'll list all of that there. And then they also have links to the voting machines themselves, a page describing what those, uh, the capabilities of those machines are. I can't recommend verified voting enough. It should be, if you're interested in voting machines, it should be a primary source for you. They have everything there. Just briefly add, if you do want to see our page, it's politico.com slash election security. Uh, you can see where your state or county is in the process of buying a new machine. We are going to eventually add what actual machine it is. We had to pick specific fields to show at the beginning. We do have that data about what they're buying. So politico.com slash election security. All right, next question. Um, So the question was, how does one reconcile the, you know, the threats that are out there that everybody understands to be out there with the reticence on the part of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to allow <laughs> election security legislation on the Senate floor? I, there's, there's no good answer. I have to be very careful about how I describe this. But you know, the Majority Leader and a lot of 
particularly Republicans, believe that these are decisions that should be made by the states and counties. And I'm not saying this because I agree or disagree. I'm just telling you this is the reasoning. Uh, it is, as, as journalists, I think we pretty much all find it jarring to hear on the one hand uh, Leader McConnell and others say we should listen to the Senate Intelligence Committee's conclusions, which were released a couple weeks ago, one of which is paper ballots are the most resistant to cyber attack. Um, to reconcile that with uh, Leader McConnell then saying we are not going to put on the floor uh, the SAFE Act or other bills like it, I will say just as kind of an armchair commentator, one thing I was, I found curious is that the Democrats in the House, the first thing they tried was H.R. 1, which if you don't know was this big grab bag bill that had election security, but it also had same day voter registration and uh, elimination of things like voter ID laws. And the result of that, whatever you think about that bill, the result is that it is very easy for the Republican leadership in the Senate to say election security is part of a Democratic agenda to change the laws that protect our country from fraudulent voting. And again, I'm not endorsing that statement. I'm saying it allows that statement to be made because the first attempt at this in the new Congress was part of something bigger. And they quickly figured out that this was not maybe the smartest idea. And they went to H.R. 2722, uh, which is just just election security. Um, but now McConnell can say this is part of something else. And that is part of the reason that those bills have not yet made it to the Senate floor, I believe. Um, as reporters, you know, we have to, inter you know, if, if we're reporting on a, a, a conflict, we have to say, you know, this is how one side says it, and we have to let the other side respond. We, we, we owe them that. Um, but at the same time, we also have an obligation to readers to call out bullshit. And I don't know of anyone who doesn't say um, in stories that relate to it now, you know, McConnell has blocked this. And, you know, experts resound, there's a consensus, experts resoundingly agree that we need uh, paper ballots. I will say I personally deeply regret not writing a story earlier that election security had become such a partisan issue in, in a way that, you know, defies logic. That is a regret I have. Not to grill you. I mean, because working at CNN, I'm thinking that there, you have probably a lot of competing interests when you are doing stories. How much influence do you have to do that? So no one is paying attention, let's say, at CNN about that the, you know, this political politicization and all that. Um, how, how, how successful, how effective can you be in steering... Um, well, I mean, the thing I just said about, you know, you include a line about McConnell is blocking all legislation. Um, I've included it in, I think, several stories. And it's honestly, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think a lot of people, no, I don't know, I don't watch TV. Um, <laughs> this is off the record, right? We're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I honestly don't know how wide, I think it's kind of widely accepted. Literally every story I've ever had it in, it's no no editor has mentioned it. It's just yes, of course that's a that's a thing. That's part of the story, and it, it goes through the process, the editing process. I don't know if there's a good answer, um, and I am positive I've missed things. I, I get a, I get so many more like insane people tips than regular people tips, and things get lost. And I know that's a fact. And if you have something you know is good, keep at it, or or try somebody else. You know, don't don't give up. Um, one thing that I find kind of difficult um, in this process, it's just a perpetual difficulty, is as reporters, you, you have to tell stories. Uh, you know, you have to, there has to be some element of a thing is happening. Uh, and we don't always have a full picture. Um, it, it's messy. Um, sorry, I don't have a good, a, a genuinely good answer here. Somebody else. So I, <laughs> I'm always overworked. I mean, there's always more stories to write. 
And sometimes it's a matter of what is the one that needs to be written right now. Um, if something is happening, uh, a bill is happening, a lawsuit is happening, something like that. And that sort of sets the agenda for you of what you need to write now. Um, in terms of, I, I mean, I would love to talk with you afterwards and find out what exactly um, that context was. Um, it, when I decide, so I get a lot of research, um, uh, not just in... Um, election stuff, but just a lot of vulnerability research that comes to me, and I have to decide what's important and what's not. Um, it's a matter of knowing what's been out there already. Is this new? Um, is this um, um, too enterprise that readers, the general reader, isn't going to be interested in it? Um, is this something that I can actually um, extract information for a reader to understand? If it's too technical, I'm going to say to them, uh, this would be great in a paper, or take it to the, the tech press. Um, so for something like that. Um, it, it really is about um, a lot of stories aren't fully baked, right? So someone will come to me with a tip or a little bit of information, but it's not quite a story yet. Um, and then I might get a little bit someplace else. And so it can take a while for a story. The story that I did this week about the voting machines online, they came to me a year ago. Um, I was in the middle of writing a story for the New York Times that was really taking all of my energy. And they weren't fully there yet. They'd done some scans, they found systems online, but they weren't very far along. Um, and it really took a while for that story to bake until it was finally ready to run. Turns out the timing was great because everyone is interested now in elections. That's another thing about elections. This stuff goes in cycles and the media and the public aren't interested in it in non-election years. Um, we've had waves. I mean, like I said, I've been covering it since 2003. There are waves of interest, uh, peaks in between 2004, 2006. Between 2006 and 2010, drops off because we got paper ballots in 2004. A lot of places got paper ballots. Everyone thought problem solved. Um, so it, it goes in waves. So it's partly about um, can you get an editor, in editor interested in it now? Um, can you get the readers interested in it? Um, is it the right time for the story? I promise that gentleman. So you guys have talked about consensus a lot. How do you feel, not, and obviously we know that consensus is more often than not wrong. How do you filter out, you know, when you find out that, hey, consensus, you know, think flat earth theory, right? Everybody was convinced that the earth was flat, and then we found out, oh, hey, no, this, this weirdo in the back office, he was right all along. So what do you guys do in that situation? And that's happened a lot, you know, recently. Do we need to, did anybody like not hear that question? Just want to know if I need to repeat it. Okay. So the difference is that you use a scientific method, right? So the way that we found out that the earth was not flat is that people tested it and they actually didn't fall off the face of the earth when they sailed over the edge of human vision. And similarly with cybersecurity and election security, if enough people do research on a system and find that a vulnerability exists and other people who have no links to those people do the same research and find the same thing, there's now consensus building around the, I, the notion that there's a vulnerability in that system. And so it's not so much how many people are saying this, is it 51%? It's that 51%, how did they arrive at that conclusion? And can I understand the method that they took to get to that point so that I'm not blindly saying that there's consensus? I actually understand, okay, they actually tested it in this way and I feel comfortable asserting to my readers that this consensus exists and that it is not some kind of flat earth type of situation. Right, but you guys aren't doing the actual research, right? You're depending right. on other people. So yes. how, do you, how do you know that they're not doing that? So at a certain point, this, this gets to like, you know, how, how do we know that the mechanics of the space shuttle are what they are? How do we know that the ways that people are testing our food for illnesses and, and viruses are what they are? I mean, at a certain point, you know, you can't test everything yourself, right? You, you, you can't do that in life. You have to go through life understanding that, you know, the, the folks who are, making, who, are, who are paving roads and designing roadways are doing that based on the best knowledge about, you know, what kind of material should be used for car wheels to drive on. You can't test that yourself before you get in a car. For us, it's, it's about looking at the past. So, for example, you know, we mentioned Matt Blaze before. Matt Blaze's research tends to be right. When he, when he claims something, it tends to be true, and the people that he's claiming it about, the vendor, the, the local community or whatever, they tend to eventually admit this. And so when I'm citing a Matt Blaze research paper, I filter in my mind the fact that 
he has turned out to be right in the past. That does not mean that I'm going to uncritically report whatever he says, but it means that you need to look at track records. That is the only way, short of testing everything for yourself, to determine what is safe to tell your readers uh, is the consensus. You have to look at track records. There's really nothing else that I, as a non-expert, can do, and that's difficult sometimes because not everybody has a long track record, and sometimes you have to take a chance. You have to talk to people who do have track records and say, is this guy bullshitting or not? And that's how you get to the point of being able to confidently tell your readers that something is happening. There was, there was something interesting in the in the early years of uh, the election integrity movement. Um, there was uh, a couple of people um, in the late '90s who were talking about um, paperless voting machines and trying to deter um, Congress and everyone else against them, and no one was listening. And I don't know, is David Jefferson here in the room? He was he was here before. So David Jefferson, a computer scientist, Livermore a National Lab, he didn't agree with them. He thought um, computers were fine, and he'll admit this now. Um, and he's one of the leading um, in integrity people. The, so the consensus wasn't even there in, among the, the, the computer science people that there was a problem with voting machines. People thought that they were okay, and they couldn't understand and it was a woman, right? So it was this fringe little woman who kind of got dismissed that she's um, trying to sound, you know, the warning and no one really paid attention. And, um, you know, they kind of laugh at it now and they're sorry that they did it and now they're fully on the bandwagon even, even more. But the consensus sometimes changes and it takes time to catch up with it. I mean, computer science, um, you know, we believe air gap systems were secure for a while there, right? And that, that oops, Stuxnet. Oops. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you know, no one really needed Stuxnet to imagine the scenario of USB sticks and all that. But, I mean, computer security, what we understand, common knowledge, um, it changes over time. Ma'am? <laughs> well, not just that, but what I see is there are cycles. So that PC Anywhere story, that was upsetting to me. I mean, I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm like, what the hell? Yes, that's, that's not good. But it dropped off, and all of a sudden I'm hearing about a 10-year-old that hacks up, which is just garbage when you read the story. So it, honestly, I'm going to be honest with CNN. It's upsetting you think that's funny. Because I never saw anybody here. Ma'am, could you phrase that as a question, please? I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. But quicker. Well, we have a group chat where we all share each other's stories, and sometimes people will say, hey, you missed something. I mean, seriously, like, you know, if, if, if I write something that's not, that misses something, I trust that eventually when Kim sees the story, she will tell me that there's something missing because she is better at this than me and has been doing this longer than me. And we all sort of try to check each other in that way, but things are going to slip through the cracks in every single system. And that is not a comforting answer and it's not a satisfying answer. It's not something we should accept. But it is the reality that everybody makes mistakes and that's true no matter how important your job is to democracy or to whatever system you're in. Yes, I, that, that is very important. We do issue corrections when we find that something is wrong. And this idea of things being cyclical and us putting a correction out, but the, the news cycle has already moved on, there's no way to solve that. That's human nature. People are going to be interested in whatever thing has just happened. There, we can't do anything to prevent that, but we can raise the visibility of our corrections when we put them out if, if in fact, we need a correction. I want to validate what you're saying. You're not imagining it. <laughs> um, yes, it's a problem. It's a problem in, in journalism. Um, it's not considered a good etiquette to call out other media outlets who are um, getting something wrong, um, journalists are getting something wrong. If you know the journalist, you can reach out to them. I have done that, they ignore me. Even other journalists ignore me. Um, media outlets ignore me. Um, I'll point out an error or something, it won't get fixed. Um, there are um, national publications that are notorious for not correcting stories, even when everyone on Twitter is pointing out an error. 
Um, it's a problem. It's a problem that journalism isn't self-aware. It doesn't have that self-reflectiveness, um, the profession. Um, aside from that, though, there is something that we can do. And, you know, Kevin was kind of talking about that. When you see a hole in what's being covered, when you see that there's something even in your own organization um, that needs to shift or whatever, you can do that. When you do see media misinterpreting stories, you can tweet and say, actually, and these guys do it a lot, um, and say, uh, well, no, they actually got that wrong. Um, so we are out there very publicly sort of, I don't want like, to say policing, but we do have an expertise in an area. We don't have an expertise in every area, um, but when we do see um, poor reporting or that they've missed something or something like that, we do, we do say it quite publicly in Twitter. I get that. I get that. But it, it's better than not doing anything. And the thing is, is that if people are reading it and then you tweet and you say, um, well, oh, actually, they missed this. This is actually what happened. Then people start tweeting that instead of the other thing. So it, I, I do see shifts. I get it. It's, all, it's, it's a problem. Twitter is a problem. Facebook is a problem for that reason, that the false story gets out there and, and it's too hard to pull back. I also have a pet peeve about stories not getting corrected. There's a story out today, there's a story that's still up from 2013, a major error story. Everyone knows it's an error. Every journalist knows it's an error, and the publication still has not put a correction on it. So it's a problem. So I'm actually going to just um, stop the Q&A and just kind of do one last question and closing remarks now so we can stay on schedule. I apologize. I'm sure you can find these guys around the village if you have a pressing question. But I kind of wanted to ask um, for your closing remarks, any thoughts of something you wanted to add as we wrap up? We've got about five minutes to do so. Um, and if you just need a prompt, um, just kind of what, what are your thoughts going into 2020? How are you planning on covering? What are you looking out for? Um, and maybe I'll start with Eric. So I think the big unaddressed issue is oversight of vendors. And Senator Wyden has really been l doing a lot of work and letter writing on this. Um, states and counties are over time learning at least that they need to improve election security even if they don't know exactly what that means. It is the vendors that have a lot of power in this space and that have so far largely been able to avoid any kind of regulation. Um, you know, when I mentioned that there are probably people in this room who work on the VVSG, but when I mentioned the VVSG, there's some laughter in some corners about the adequacy of that to protect what is critical infrastructure. Can anybody imagine if the telecom or manufacturing or energy sectors managed by DHS and other agencies were only governed by the equivalent of the VVSG? and states could put other things on there if they wanted to. It would be absurd. We would all laugh. But that is the current situation in election security. Vendors are not required to report cybersecurity incidents. They're not required to let independent researchers test their products under anything short of an extremely onerous NDA. And the reason for that is because nobody is telling them that they can't do that. And as a journalist, what I'm going to be looking for in the lead up to 2020 and afterwards is what changes. ESNS has said that it wants to only sell paper ballots. It's still selling paperless machines and for voters with disabilities, but it's at least recognizing that it has to say something about this. Uh, what are the other vendors going to say? What is Congress going to do? Will there be a requirement to create some kind of vulnerability disclosure program? Uh, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Um, I want to reiterate that we often don't know what we don't know and uh, often rely on people like you who see things on the ground that need to be brought to the public's attention. Uh, if you have, you know, a tip to bring it to somebody, um, it's not a guarantee that it will make it into the news. And you often, you might not even know if it just helps our coverage in general if you alert us to something. Uh, and I want to say again that if you do have something as a source, if it's something sensitive, you do have the power. You know, you can come to one of us. You know, we all have our signal uh, numbers pro uh, public, right? Um, come to us, say, I, I only want to speak like in these terms uh, and set the terms for the discussion. Uh, you have that power and we rely on you. 
I guess I would say going into 2020, I feel encouraged and discouraged. Um, discouraged because DHS is touting how much work they've done in the last three years, and um, election districts are talking about how much progress they've made in the last three years. And then I publish a story this week that says all those voting machines are still on the internet. So I don't know what they're doing or what they've been doing for the last three years. I feel encouraged though that there's a lot of tension on all of this. I feel uh, um, encouraged that DHS is involved. Um, that there is um, expert uh, security knowledge being trickling down now to the states and, and to the counties. Um, I mean, Congress, the, you know, one of the, the, the stops here is Congress giving states more money. I feel like there's at least a willfulness in the states now, um, more at the state level than maybe the county levels, um, to actually listen and engage in this, um, but they can't do much without money. They have to be able to hire um, someone who's going to monitor those logs and install them correctly and get um, secure processes in place and get someone in the office who is actually there saying, no, do not put that USB stick in the voting machine. So um, we have a long way to go, but um, there's a tension on it, and that's good. Well, I think uh, we have nothing more to add. I'd like to thank our panelists, and thank you all for joining us. So.